Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host. I'm its creator. I'm its cat herder. And apparently I am literally herding at least one cat today. So ably assisted by my female companion, um, let's begin. Now let me have the pleasure of introducing this week's guests. Um, our subject is how to teach the humanities online. In order to explore this, we're gonna look at a fascinating project that was done by the Council of Independent Colleges that involved dozens of colleges teaching upper level humanities seminars to each other. In order to explore this, we have three terrific guests. Uh, we have Joellen Parker, Barbara Hetrick, and Phil Katz, all with the CIC. Each of them are good friends and brilliant people, and they just published a report about this. So let me just beam them one, on, one by one on stage so they can say hello. So to begin with, let me add Joellen Parker. Hello. There I am. Hello, everybody. Greetings. Where are you today? I am in my office in D.C. Oh, fantastic. fantastic. I'm about 20 feet from uh, Phil and Barb, who are in an office down the hall. Well, they're going to come up and they'll be even closer to you uh, via the magic of technology. But to, to introduce you to everybody, Joel, let, let me just ask, what will you be working on for 2020? What are the big projects or ideas that will be top of mind for you? Oh, gosh. Well, one of the issues that we're thinking a lot about at CIC is uh, public understanding and public impressions of what we do as humanists scholars and teachers uh, who are passionate about liberal arts colleges. Mm. Mm. So we're thinking a lot about how we demonstrate and articulate the importance of carrying the traditions of liberal arts colleges and instruction in the humanities into the digital age. And that may sound to you like a fairly familiar phrase, Brian, given that we started talking about uh, the liberal arts for the digital age, how many years ago together, you and I? 20 years. 20 years ago, 20 years ago, when we worked together in the context of Nightly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I continue to be obsessed with promoting humanities education and the liberal arts in today's socioeconomic, political, digital, and economic environments. Well, that's a fantastic goal. I wholeheartedly support it. Um, and I can see how that would take any normal person three or four lifetimes. But for you, it's part of the job. That's right. Um, well, welcome, Joel. I'm so glad to see you. Now, so let, glad to be here. Well, let's add some other people. Let's bring on board Barbara and Phil. So also from the DC area, greetings. Hi, Brian. Good to see you again. Nice to see you. I guess we're, we're kind of conjoined twins today. Um, let me say from the outset, uh, this is a, a bit of a small world. Uh, this project was supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, but fundamental to its success was Brian Alexander and our colleague from Ithaca SNL, uh, Deanna Markham. Well, it's very nice of you to say that about me. I, I only played a small role. Um, Deanna Markham played a great role, and we had her as a guest on the program before. Um, let me just ask both of you, and thank you again for the nice words. What will you two be working on for 2020? Um, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first. First thing, I'll be supporting Joellen in the effort that she just described about uh, helping people make better arguments for the importance of uh, small private liberal arts colleges in this uh, particular a somewhat fraught moment. Uh, also involved in a project for, with another aspect of the humanities, which is not really digital, but it's the public humanities. Mm. Uh, we're supporting efforts by a number of our institutions to create projects that combine um, undergraduate research on underused um, real materials, uh, artifacts, records in their museums and archives, and translating them into uh, public programs that connect with the community. So we're both interested in the digital piece of the humanities, but also uh, some of the more traditional expressions of the humanities. Fantastic, Phil. Thank you. And Barb, what are you going to be working on? Well, I'm one of the uh, former provosts and deans and faculty members on the CIC staff, and so I tend to lean in that direction. Sure. So, for example, high priorities will be to oversee uh, two of our major leadership development programs, 
One is called the Senior Leadership Academy, which prepares administrators, a mid to lower level administrators to assume vice presidencies. And the other is the Executive Leadership Academy, which prepares future presidents. And um, another is that I'm working with our colleague, Kelsey Sherman Creech, with support from the AARP Foundation oh. to um, finish up one aspect of our wildly successful intergenerational connections program uh, and perhaps prepare for an extension. Oh. You look like you have a question. I have one question. Would you tell me more about that intergenerational program? Well, we have, I think it is 42 colleges and universities that have established connections between their undergraduates and seniors. That means people 55 and over mm -hmm. uh, in their communities. And they are working together to meet mutual goals so that the students acquire uh, social skills and education about uh, aging and so on, and mm -hmm. how to start and complete projects. The seniors um, are helped with such problems as social isolation, um, aging in place, um, having enough to eat, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was just more successful and had uh, more variations than we had expected. And Brian, for those of the participants who don't really know about CIC, I should say that, and here's our, our logo behind my shoulder, um, you know, we're a presidential membership organization, so a lot of the work we've done traditionally in the past has been sort of uh, inward looking at our colleges, helping them improve sort of administration at the presidential level, the provost level, the level department chairs and so forth. But the projects we've just been describing here have been very much uh, outward facing projects. And so we've spent more time the last few years thinking about the connection between uh, our colleges and the outside world around them, whether it's the older populations Barb just talked about, or the public humanities work that I was just talking about, or the advocacy work that Joe Ellen was talking about. Um, and I, I'm not sure if we've we've lost Brian. I was going to say, did anybody else lose Brian? We can just hijack this, Joe Ellen, if you'd like. <laughs> Brian. Well, I'll mention another project as long as I have opportunity. Um, I'm also working with the Teagle funded project. Um, that is trying to create transfer with ease between community college students and uh, our independent colleges and universities. The object of that, of course, is to increase the proportion of students in community colleges who say they're interested in completing bachelor's level degrees, uh, but few of whom do currently. So both for the workforce and for the, the advancement of those students, we want to make it a friendlier process. Thank you. Uh, can you all see and hear me okay? Yes, now we can. Yes. Oh, it was interesting. My laptop just decided to have a hiccup. Um, it must have been something I said. It may be, Barb. I mean, this is you know the terrifying force um, uh, of your words. Uh, thank you all three for explaining more about the CIC. One quick question for everybody um, who doesn't know the CIC. How many colleges and universities are members now? Oh, nearly 800. Okay. A, a various size, but the core is, is about 660 uh, small private colleges and universities. Wow, that's a lot of schools. Well, uh, friends, uh, given that background, let's dive into the question of teaching the humanities online. Who wants to tell us about this fantastic multi-year project? Well, I think Phil's going to start. Oh, okay, I will, I will start. Yeah. Um, I'm this, the hook. this began before I joined uh, CIC, and the genesis of this um, multi-year project was really the, um, the heightened attention around MOOCs a few years ago. And I'm sure everyone here remembers when that seemed to be the only thing that people were talking about in relationship to online learning. Um, and so CIC started exploring, well, what does that mean for small private colleges that really don't have the, the scale problem of how do we teach an introductory computer science course to thousands of people? That's not an issue for our members. But right. there were other issues that connected with um, online instruction. And as we talked to more people, we realized a good area of focus was the upper level courses in the liberal arts that really are at the core of the um, sort of the relationship-based learning that's always been key to liberal arts colleges. 
Um, so we, we went to the Mellon Foundation and we talked to them and said, well, let's, how could we create a project that gave individual institutions in our orbit an opportunity to create small online courses uh, focused on, on the liberal arts, especially the humanities, but also to have them think about how those could be uh, shared between institutions. So we went into this with, uh, with three goals uh, in, this, in this project, um, which was to talk about the quality of online instruction for upper division humanities courses, uh, and to explore what quality would look like and whether uh, the quality and the pedagogy was comparable to the sorts of teaching that we, um, we knew worked because it's worked for hundreds of years. Right. The, the second issue was to look at um, the economics of it. There were some questions, open questions, and I think less open now, but we can get to that later, about potential cost savings, that if you uh, could amortize online instruction over a number of years and you could combine forces with other institutions, potentially there was money to be saved in there. And of course, behind all of this activity is our deep concern for the the future of the humanities. I mean, it's certainly no secret that uh, the humanities have been compromised in some ways by the current financial difficulties in higher education, including independent higher education. We know that enrollments have decreased, the number of majors has decreased in many cases. Uh, institutions are choosing to invest their resources in other fields, such as those more closely connected with clear-cut careers, um, and they're also turning to uh, new populations for financial reasons, uh, mm -hmm. older students, adult students, evening students, graduate students. So we wanted to see, is there potential mm -hmm. in this cooperation among independent institutions to preserve the humanities? And the, the, third, the third piece, and that's very much the context that we're operating in, the third discrete question was, um, what forms of collaboration among small institutions would be most successful, uh, both for the institutions themselves, but also across a network of institutions? So with that background and those goals, we went and we identified um, two cohorts of institutions. First cohort, starting in 2014, uh, 21 institutions, uh, the second cohort, another 21 institutions, and the structure was very similar, a two-year, um, more or less two-year cycle. The first year, we invited uh, two faculty members from each participating institution, each to either create or transform into a digital online class, um, a traditional upper-level humanities course. Tried out their own institution in the first year. They revised it in the second year. Those courses were open to participants from the other institutions as well. So it was uh, create, review, open to the other institutions, uh, and rinse and repeat with a second, a second group of institutions. And we learned a lot from that first cohort. Yes. And I'll just give a couple examples. We learned that it was silly to create this consortium of all faculty members without including the registrars. Mm. Um, we spent so much time worrying about issues that we didn't have to worry about because when we finally realized the registrar should be involved in the second cohort, uh, they just got together and sliced right through those those issues. So, so Brian, you were along for the ride. So you've seen much of this. And I don't know if you want to guide us through a conversation about, I mean, there's at least three clusters of, of big issues here. There are the, the pedagogy issues, there are the technology issues, and there are the institutional cooperation issues. And we have things to say about all of them, but maybe uh, you have a sense how you'd like to direct that conversation with us. Uh, I have both a sense and a sense, but, um, but before I do that, um, let me ask everybody, um, I'd like to ask some basic questions to help um, probe at this and help you know, build our understanding of, of the experiment. But also I would like to make sure that everybody here feels comfortable asking questions. Uh, so again, please just use at the very bottom of the screen either that raise hand button if you'd like to join us on stage or use the question mark if it's type in a question. So if your question is, how was this paid for? What were some of the classes? What worked? What didn't work? How on earth did you convince faculty to do this? Whatever how question you have, please, this is your forum. This is your space for that kind of question. And I, I would like to just ask, one really, really quick question. Can you give us some examples of the kinds of classes that were involved, of subject matter? 
Well, I'll start and Phil will get more specific. Great. And I'll start because one of the lessons we learned in the first consortium um, is that faculty were reluctant to offer the basic courses. Nobody teaches Shakespeare like we teach Shakespeare after all. So what they offered at first were esoteric, um, tangential electives. And for the second consortium, we learned that it would be to the benefit of most of the institutions as well as the group as a whole if we insisted that the courses be generally required courses. And the, the most important reason for that is because one of our goals became to serve students who have difficulty getting uh, those courses that they need for graduation. So they can graduate on time. Uh, students such as working adults, students studying abroad, um, students with internships, uh, students who are athletes. And so we insisted that Shakespeare should be one of those courses. Very good. Let me uh, go back to the original question. The, the topics were really um, all over the place, ranging from some quite specialized courses in uh, the history of the book, for example, or a course about um, pilgrimage as part of the experience of, of religion across comparative religions. Yes. Uh, and actually that was a very audacious one because it incorporated a very, very embodied exercise of, of pilgrimage, of people moving physically from one place to another and successfully translated into an online environment. And we can come back to that. Um, but we really did have a range of things from the sort of intermediate level, you know, the history of the American Revolution class, a um, an introduction to um, uh, Indian philosophy class, mm. and then there were some that were um, a little more specialized, and then there were some that were a little less specialized, especially the language courses. Um, and I know that that Barb will have some things to say about, but the language courses very much are, um, you know, they 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 build on top of previous courses. So there's a lot of different things you can do in something called uh, intermediate Russian or intermediate French. Mm. So I do encourage people to look at you know, our, our report. It's, it's quite an interesting range of subjects across the traditional humanities. And the report should be <laughs> linked to it on the screen. There should be a button uh, which you can press and grab that report. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, one of the community, and I'd like to just bring this up on stage very quickly. This is a text question again, so it's asked by type, by pressing the uh, question mark button. Uh, and this comes in from Charles Finley, Eastern, who asks, "Who owns the classes, and are they available for open access? And what learning management systems were used to develop and deliver them?" Um, let me answer those in reverse order. The LMS question: the answer is everything. Uh, and one of the findings of this report. Uh, is that the technology issues were were not the interesting issues. I mean, there were lots of interesting wrinkles there, and people did lots of interesting uh, experiments in how to use technology and use an impressive range of technology. But the faculty members pretty much made anything work. Uh, and that's a real strength, but also there were some weaknesses because if you had a student enrolling somewhere else, they'd have to learn a new LMS. But name your favorite management system and someone was using it. Hmm. Who owns the classes? Uh, I'll be blunt, that was an issue we sidestepped. Um, <clears throat> we knew it was a short-term experiment and we were primarily interested in the pedagogy issues. Um, we bracketed the question of ownership, which we know is very important. Um, along the way, there were discussions uh, at the workshops that we did about institutional policies about that. And the institutional policies are all over the place. So the, the quick answer to that one is, um, in most cases, either the instructor or their institution owns it, and these have not been opened up as, um, as open resources, although some of the materials from individual faculty members, they have shared in various ways. But these were, these were selectively open to uh, friends courses, not generally open to the world courses. Uh, that's okay. right. Can I say another word about uh, this question of platforms and LMSs? Uh, because I do think one of the really interesting things about the study is how cheerfully people were tool and platform and LMS agnostic um, and, and willing to pitch in in the spirit of whatever works. At CIC, as we're trying to learn more about how 
these opportunities can grow on smaller campuses. Uh, we're also doing a shared platform uh, project at this point called the Online Course Sharing Consortium. Mm. And that operates rather differently because it does invite people onto a common platform um, to, to exchange courses among a community. So we're really trying to understand how these kinds of projects are going to work best on participating campuses. And we're exploring different modalities. Uh, some of them are platform agnostic and some of them are platform specific. Fantastic. That's pretty research. Um, thank you, all three of you. The, uh, for these answers. And uh, thank you, Charles, for the great question. Again, if you're new to the forum, it's that easy to ask a question. Um, and also, we have a, another, speaking of which, I'm encouraging people and they're following up. We have a question from uh, Tom Haynes. So let me bring Tom up on stage so that he can join us. Hello, Tom. Hi, Tom. Hi. How's everybody doing? Hey, so um, yeah, my question actually could have probably been read, but I'll 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 I'll, I'll, I'll recite it. Um, so I mean, I had a very fairly simple, straightforward question. So the the courses themselves, what constituted a course as far as the material that was shared? Um, you know, what pieces did y'all use of the LMS and so on and so forth? And secondly, did the professors who uh, developed the course? Were they always the ones who were teaching that particular module or course? Interesting. Good question. Well, the answer to the last question is yes. Uh, the the faculty <laughs> member who developed the course nearly always taught the course. Okay. And the mechanisms of approval uh, were, in the, were the ones that were uh, standard at each of the institutions. So in some in, in indications, the department, the curriculum committee, and the full faculty had to approve the courses. So we followed whatever procedure uh, they used. And, and Tom, I think this is a place to reinforce the issues of, of scale that we're looking at um, here. So no, institutions were not creating modules that could be repurposed and taught by other instructors. And I would actually say we, the type of resistance that we got from institutions and from individual faculty, that was probably not feasible for these courses at this at this moment. Um, but again, let me, the, the issue of, of, of scale. Um, we're not looking here to have tremendous new numbers. We're looking at problems of scale of going from, say, seven to 12 students in an upper division uh, course and opening up to a few other people from other institutions to make a course uh, intellectually and economically viable. Um, so that's not a set of scale issues that so much required uh, reusable course content. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't institutions who are thinking along those lines as well. And, and frankly, faculty members in the humanities are worried about, um, uh, about that kind of plug and play approach. Well, and for those of you at larger institutions, we should emphasize that going from seven students to 12 or 15 students might save that course. The dean will be less likely to el eliminate the offering. That's one advantage. Um, but also, it makes it more predictable when the courses will be offered. The students can count on having those courses and not having them pulled out from under them. So was was there a cap on the course enrollment? That was at the discretion of the individual institution. We put a lot of, um, both to get buy-in, but also for very practical reasons in this experimental stage, we told the host institutions, you figure out what's the maximum that you're comfortable doing with the proviso that you must set aside a certain number of seats for students from other institutions. So I think the largest one may have been up to 25 mm -hmm. students in that kind of range, but most of them were in the um, 10, 15 range, not out of line at all with the face-to-face -face courses that are being taught successfully at these institutions. Mm -hmm. So not exactly MOOCs. <laughs> no. no, not even close. Yeah. No. So, we wanted to benefit the small private liberal arts college. Okay, no, absolutely. No, I, and, and in keeping with that, that kind of question and the enrollment size and everything and the tools available, I mean, one of the one of the concerns that I have about 
the way most online uh, learning platforms operate this, today is that they tend to be very isolating experiences for the students. Oh. And so I was wondering if there were any efforts made. I mean, to me, that's one of the strengths of a small liberal arts college is that community of learners that, uh, uh, you know, and now you may have people who are hundreds or thousands of miles away from another college uh, participating in this course. So how did you guys combat that issue or was that a concern? Well, we, to be, be sure, we measured it uh, frequently. So what we learned, much to our, our delight, is that students reported very little difference in their level of involvement in these online courses than in their traditional face-to-face -face courses. Um, the, the faculty members involved were a little surprised at that, but as Phil keeps re reminding me, this younger generation is much more comfortable with online everything. Um, so uh, I'll tell you what, what we also loved about this is that students who were reluctant to speak up in a traditional classroom reported that they were more likely to interact with others in the online atmosphere. So that was that was a plus. Right. I mean, Tom, you, you, I think, voiced the same concern that many of our participants uh, voiced. And, and I should say that in some cases, some institutions, the two faculty members who were selected to be part of the project were selected precisely because they had that attitude and precisely had that um, that skeptical approach to what could go on in the online program. I'm glad to say we, we converted them in most cases, but the fact that they went in with this concern for interaction um, meant that uh, the most successful courses, and, and, and that would include most courses in the second iteration, made very strong efforts to, um, to build a strong sense of presence and strong interaction, frequently by um, having a lot of structure having more structure than the faculty members mm -hmm. or the students often had in face-to-face in -face classes. And I think we did make converts among faculty members who said, that's something I learned. And I, I brought a structure to my online class that occurred participation. And um, heck, I've got to now do that with my face-to-face -face class because I've never provided that level of structure. And maybe I can uh, plow some lessons back in and improve interaction in what we thought was a face-to-face -face environment that had worked successfully for, for hundreds of years. And if I could add to that, and you're getting close to some of our most important findings, um, is that uh, faculty reported that no longer did they see our traditional face-to-face -face courses as the gold standard in teaching. So it was not at all the case that they were trying to replicate the in-class experience online. As a matter of fact, most reported that they, they took a lot of the approaches that they had developed for online teaching and learning and used them to improve their traditional courses. And if I could offer one quotation, one of the faculty members said, I thought my tech skills would become amazing and my teaching would not change much. In fact, it was quite the opposite. <laughs> right. can, can, yeah. First of all, Tom, thank you. Thank you for the great question. Um, and again, if um, and and hello to Houston. I hope you're staying uh, nice and warm. <laughs> well, it's it's not it's not that cold, but it's uh, cold. In it's cold enough. Well, it's I mean, it's for Houston cold. I mean, it's uh, I think in the fifties. I'm I'm trying to be sympathetic. Thank, thank, uh, thank you. <laughs> hey, you're not in Vermont. I mean, in Vermont anymore. I don't want to hear it. I know what your weather's like, Brian. <laughs> I used to live there. Let, let, let me say um, again, if you're new to the forum, this is uh, this is the way it works, where you can have somebody appear on stage quite easily. Um, but also, I just want to pull out two of those key points that really, really, I, I think I want to make sure everyone hears. One is that the engagement was about the same online as it was in face-to-face -face classes. And this is a huge, huge takeaway, especially when you think about MOOCs, which we won the conversation with, where the engagement is actually pretty poor. So this group managed to crack that secret and was able to have that kind of on par level of engagement. And the second was the last point that Barb made, this is so important, that they, the faculty were able to plow their online learning back into their more online learning, but also push that back into their face-to-face -face classes. So this is a tremendous professional development uh, opportunity. Uh, so I just want to make sure that um, that we got all that. And thank you, thank you all three for, uh, for all those rich, rich answers. Um, 
we have more questions coming up, uh, and one comes from uh, Judy Kaplow. Uh, let me see if I can bring her up on stage as well. Hello, Professor Kaplow. How are you? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Perfectly. Perfectly. Okay. Um, my question involves, because I do teach online humanities classes, um, actually just one, but uh, my students sometimes uh, come from having taken uh, online classes before, but they very seldom have taken a humanities class or a liberal arts class. Uh, and they generally remark on how different the classes are. Uh, they've come from STEM fields or from technical fields. And I'm wondering if there is, um, in your experience, a consistent pattern of certain challenges that show up in humanities classes online as opposed to traditional face-to-face -face humanities classes or STEM classes or other classes that are on online. What, what are the characteristic issues that a, a new humanities teacher who wants to experiment with online should be uh, cautious about? Great question. Fantastic question. Thank you. Um, but who wants to take a whack at that one? Oh, Brian, Brian, do you have a fantastic answer? You've been teaching uh, <laughs> modalities more recently than I think um, the rest of us. I, I will say that to, that there are, are two questions folded together there, and I'm not sure how to separate the two of them, which is the difference between um, STEM classes and the humanities classes, and the difference between the online and the face-to-face. -face. And I actually think the first one is more determinative here than the than the second question, based on the experience of our of our faculty members who didn't really have trouble uh, translating the interpretive approaches of humanities instruction onto an online uh, environment. But I've let any, all of my colleagues uh, extend on that. Well, I could say in my limited experience is that the humanities courses require more interaction among students between faculty member and, and student. And that may make it more difficult to teach online. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. That's been my experience as well. I, I have to ask you, what, what class do you teach? I teach a Great Ideas in World Civilizations course, Ooh. Ooh. which is, oh, no, uh, it's, it's actually great. Um, I get a lot of discussion going on because I can use the discussion forums. And uh, I would add to what you were saying earlier that I find the students are more engaged in the online courses yeah. because they don't have the, the option of sitting back and just listening. In order to function in an online course, they need to actually say something. They can't just, uh, you know, I know that everyone here who's familiar with the online community knows about the four different types of students. Usually you hear about three, I added a fourth. Um, the three students are the the lurker, the shirker, and the worker. You know those, right? Um, but I added a porker, and that's the person who won't shut up. Um, who, who, and that's me, unfortunately. Um, the person who who keeps at responding to what everybody says. Uh, and takes up pages and pages and pages of people's time and room. Um, but the, we get we we do get some workers, and we get shirkers, of course, as we do in all classes. But the lurkers is only possible in online class. That's when the person reads everybody else's stuff and never says anything. And if they do that, they don't get credit for being there. So um, I get my students at the end of the semester saying things like, I didn't realize that I could speak without worrying about what other people thought of me. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier online to do that. Yep. And we get a, I get a lot of positive feedback about the discussion forums in the class because it really does, that particular class, the Great Ideas course, does require an awful lot of discussion. 
Um, I found that to be a hugely important element in the course. You know, one of the- Hugely productive. One of the most interesting pieces of feedback we got, uh, and it's in the report, I will paraphrase this because I don't have the quotation open in front of me, but it was a president who had followed his institution's involvement who said that in online discussion forums, what he called the two second thinker mm -hmm. and the 10 second thinker. Yeah, I the same thing. field. yeah, I see. Where, where the, the two second thinkers will run right over the 10 second thinkers in a live discussion sometime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But online, people can find their pace. And uh, I think that really does support the kinds of discussions you're trying to create in your, your Great Ideas course. Mm -hmm. The one problem that I have that I have seen in my class was well, it's not the only problem, but the one consistent problem is getting students to take ownership of the readings. Yeah. Um, very often they because nobody's watching them do the readings. They're they're being watched while they're doing the discussions in right. a sense. Right. But they can do the readings off on their own. And uh, sometimes they, they don't do it or they don't do it attentively. And I don't know whether that's better or worse in an online environment than it is in face-to-face. -face. But I know that it is significantly more important. It, it's much more important in a humanities class than it is in a STEM field. Well, our faculty members reported that they did have to be more structured. They did have to build in uh, checkpoints. Um, they did have to help students with time management to make sure they didn't always wait until the last minute to do assignments. So yes, but then that's an example of a, a tech teaching technique that they brought back over to their face-to-face -face courses. It, it also highlights a difference, I think, between face-to-face -face and the online. My sense of uh, from talking to our instructors is that that kind of structure in the class was less obtrusive and less um, mm -hmm. in your face than if it were in a face-to-face -face class. If you had a face-to-face -face class where you said, you know, every uh, half hour, here's a very specific small task that you need to complete to move mm -hmm. to the next stage, people would bristle with that in ways that in the online environment, both the students and the faculty members saw that as, oh, that's a productive uh, milestone of a small sort that I can do to keep on track. Right. That's actually one of the things that some people learn work better in the online environment, and it's a different pedagogical approach and works well in some face-to-face -face, uh, mm -hmm. That was a real insight for some of the uh, instructors. Okay. Well, thank you. I have to say thank you. That's a fantastic question. It sounds like you have a, a terrific class that I wish I had a chance to take. It, it's a great class. Um, I want to teach sure how I, I'm not sure how I would teach it face to face anymore, frankly. Wow. What a, what a, what a story for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for great answers. Speaking of you all, let me, uh, let me just thank uh, people who have come in uh, over the past few minutes. Uh, Sierra, Giselle, Amanda, uh, Vanessa, and Roxanne. Great to see you again. So again, uh, we, are, we are exploring this wonderful report about this wonderful project. And uh, we have another guest. Uh, this is Tom Riley, who has a question. I might be able to guess what this is. Let's see what you think, Tom. Hello. <coughs> Hello, Tom. I'm a uh, technical guy uh, working on our climate crisis. Uh, in the la latest meeting in uh, Spain, they upped the, emer emer the level <coughs> of our climate crisis to our climate emergency. One of the things we need is new myths. That is stories about a sustainable earth. That's the particular thing I'm working on. Do you know of any uh, classes in, for, uh, in creative writing type things that are specifically looking at new stories to address uh, our climate emergency without just flat out dystopias, which I will not tolerate. Good question, Tom. A uh, quick, quick question, Tom. Are you referring to uh, COP25? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. 
No? I don't know. Okay. No, and none, and actually one of the one of the instructors in um, our consortia did do a course about environmental literature, but I I don't know if that was the specific focus. I'm sure that there are people out there teaching that, but not in the immediate purview that we've that we've seen. And and if they aren't, they should be. So you should be out there telling people uh, this is the topic for their next seminar for their students. Uh, the problem is that we have technical people like myself can write the background beats, the, the, the background story of the technical evolution that could address the problem, right. but we can't write uh, character and plot mm. that will get published. And so that, the idea is for us technical people to write the background, then we go on top with your people uh, who write plot, characters, etc. Thank you. Oh, thank Do you. Great professor colleagues want to respond to that? What? Well, it's a, it, it's a, it's a tricky and deep one. Um, my, my friend Eric Rabkin taught a class, um, a MOOC that involved uh, collaborative writing, um, but I believe it was academic writing rather than uh, fiction writing. Um, so beyond that, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to explore. Uh, thank you, Tom, um, for a good question. You know, fantastic cause. Uh, speaking of causes, I, I was wondering if we could circle back a little bit um, to uh, one of the uh, motivations uh, that uh, Phil outlined in the beginning of this program. Um, one of the questions was about cost savings. I'm, I'm curious, what did you? What's your conclusion looking at this project now? Did uh, did this actually save money? Did it cost more money? Was it a wash? What was your economic analysis? I'd say that um, it didn't save. It, it was a short project, a, a couple years, and so some had some colleges had to invest in the technology. Some had to uh, hire um, instructors to help faculty members design their courses. Um, but over two or three years there were negligible cost savings. And yet most of the institutions predict that over the long run, they will save, save uh, money, partly because they can offer these highly specialized courses uh, less often, but in a predictable fashion. Um, they can fill their own curricular gaps with consortium courses, rotations become more predictable and, and we're less likely to have last minute cancellations. Mm. Uh, it saves salaries that otherwise might be used on adjuncts mm. um, for faculty members on leave. Um, and, and so we're, we're watching this and we know the institutions are watching this. Uh, students report that they saved some money uh, on textbooks because these courses were more likely to uh, have online resources. Oh, Let me add something that's not in the report, but um, that I've been thinking about a lot recently. We were unable to prove one way or the other that there were hard cost savings, uh, given the length of the project and some other things. And our, our assumption, I think, as, as Barbara just mentioned, that there are costs, there are startup costs, there are real costs, money's not going to be saved. But it may be the wrong question. I've come around thinking that, that yep. the question about cost came from an institutional perspective where if we turn the question around, think from a student's perspective, that there are better questions to be asking. Uh, the students told us that they value the flexibility. They value the way in which these type of courses fit within their educational plan. And that return means that the institutions are serving students better and that students probably have a better opportunity to uh, graduate in a timely manner and to stay on track. So the real, I would say the real reason for institutions to be doing this um, is not so much because they're going to save money, but because they're going to save their students. I mean, their students are going to benefit in ways that go beyond the exact accounting of instructional resources saved through uh, online or even collaborative work. Brian, I, I don't want us to close this without me telling my favorite instructor example. Please, please do. So let me pop in here. Uh, Phil's heard this a million times, but when we first started, this program, we had faculty members in Russian studies in two rather prestigious liberal arts colleges. And they came to the first meeting saying, 
well, our department, our faculty, our curriculum committee will never approve these courses. And of course, I'm thinking, well, well why are you here? Um, but over time, they solved these, these institutional problems. And here's the, the good news. Uh, those Russian studies faculty members, four of them, have created an, a highly functioning single department. And that is serving their students so much better. They have four different specializations and have reported that they're off the chop, chopping block. You know, it's really easy to eliminate a two-person department that doesn't have a meaty major, a substantive major. But when you have four, you have a much more substantial major. And I'd like to report they have added a third prestigious institution. So they now have six faculty members with six different specializations, and they have uh, developed cooperative arrangements with Russian uh, universities. These are Russian studies faculty members, Russian studies departments, and so, so far as we know, uh, this collaboration is serving as a model for potential humanities uh, majors everywhere. Yes. I, I, I Brian, can, I, can I toss in here just Please. a couple of more words since we're on this theme? Uh, coincidentally, uh, long before I joined CIC, I was the uh, president of one of the colleges that raised its hand to be part of the first cohort. Um, and one of the things I talked about to my campus colleagues a lot in trying to persuade them to participate is that, uh, and I think Phil was pointing to this point uh, just a second ago, it's very important, I think, not to think about cost savings, but about cost-effective value creation. Okay. And the idea that I, I really tried to emphasize with my colleagues, and I think it's an idea that uh, we need to keep in the discussion, is that we may not ultimately reduce spending per se, but we can create much greater value without significantly increasing spending. And that's a plus for the institution. And I think when uh, when Bill is reminding us about some of the values that we can create for students without significantly increasing expenditures through the wise use of technology, I'd really rather hear us talk about cost-effective value creation than about reduced spending. And it's also what the faculty members at our institutions want to hear about. Because that's right. And you know, and I think it, probably everyone in the room knows, there's still significant lingering fears among faculty members that online instruction mm -hmm. begins replacing instructors with technology. Um, but in fact, if you come out with the perspective that Duellen was just saying, um, that says the faculty are more important or just as important as ever. And it's a much more strategic approach to technology and one that this, I hope faculty members are less fearful of than a perspective that says this is a way to massify what we're doing, especially for upper division humanities work. Well, that's a great answer. Um, I, I really appreciate the way that you that you all responded uh, to the economic question and then turned it into uh, a very positive direction as well. Um, we have. Uh, we have more questions, and we are starting to run out of time in this hour. Uh, there's just so much going on in this topic that uh, um, I, I don't want to lose people in this. But let me just bring up uh, our wonderful long-term friend of the program. Let me bring up uh, Roxanne Riskin, who's coming to you from uh, Connecticut, I think. Roxanne, hello. A very cold and snowy Connecticut right now. We're throwing, we're, I don't know if we're throwing out or not. I doubt it. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Thank you, um, all of you uh, wonderful members for this wonderful report. I have a, um, a real brief question and that is on how instructional designers have helped your faculty members in designing the courses and were they given um, a specific amount of time to develop the courses and how much do you think um, it benefited the faculty members from having the designers help. Well, I can tell you the faculty members themselves reported that that they learned an enormous amount and benefited extraordinarily mm -hmm. from uh, instructional designers. Right. And, and I would say one of the things that we learned, if we if we had pursued a third iteration of this experiment, 
I think I would approach us including specifically instructional designers as part of the team. I think one of the lessons from this is that institutions where faculty had access to that sort of support, that they did a better job. And listen, uh, and listen to this, they, the faculty reported that they now see teaching as more of a team effort collaborative effort on campus as well as across campuses. Right. But there's still a lot of um, uh, evangelizing to do. We do know some institutions that were involved in this project went back at the end and said, from what we've learned, we need to move up the investments that we've made in instructional design. And that's and that's happened. And I hope that there are people who read our report at similar institutions who say, okay, this convinces us that some uh, investment up front needs to take place for good instruction online. Uh, but it's still, there's work to be done. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, one quick um, follow up, Please. kind of in a different direction. So it's uh, totally on the same topic. But how are you uh, using the library and have you involved any library resources as um, effective? Um, I guess, participants in developing the courses or as resources, add, add, add additional resources, I guess. We do not do it systematically, but I do know that there are some institutions where uh, they involve librarians as content experts, or as, as you know, at a lot of institutions, the library is the sort of locus of instructional design yeah. that exists on campus. And we learned that through another project we have too that used um, well, JSTOR or what we call shared shelf uh, resources to develop um, collections that could be used in these courses. So they're programs uh, informing other programs. That were That's programs. wonderful because I, I was w considering in my mind the open educational resources so it would bring the costs down. And you mentioned yeah. that in your report as the students not having to bear the burden of these barriers of huge expensive text resources. Well, I just finished a report on this shared shelf project. So oh, uh, look, look for that or contact me. It's not yet okay. uh, edited. <laughs> thank you, but, That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that great question, Roxanne. Please stay warm. <laughs> thank you. I, I, we, we have only two minutes to go, and, and we could talk about this for days. Uh, so let me just take the host's privilege and ask one last question. Looking ahead over the next decade, I mean, we're thinking about the 2020s already, in just a few weeks, do you see more upper-level humanities classes being taught like this, either across the U.S. or in other countries? Joellen? <laughs> We certainly hope to see that. We certainly hope to see that. And I think that as we are able to use documents like this report uh, to illustrate the ways in which this can be responsive to some of the pressures that Bill started out talking about early in the hour uh, that exist on the humanities, there's a very active uh, interest in making sure that the humanities remain integrated into student experience. And I think that as we have research findings such as we're presenting in the report that help assure people that they can both maintain the pedagogical spirit that they want to maintain yeah. while protecting uh, the place of especially upper level humanities courses in their curricula, I think we're going to be able to build a stronger and stronger argument so I certainly hope so. And I think reports like this are really important because it's where we turn from just sort of proselytizing to demonstrate. Well, and, and think about the number of humanities departments across our institutions that have two or three faculty members who feel endangered. Um, it'd be crazy not to adopt this kind of approach to, to a, a work with, with colleagues across the country. Just think of, of the rigorous curricula that could be offered. Thinking about the uh, story you mentioned about the Russian program. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, speaking of rush in, we have to uh, to the end of this. Um, Joelle and Barb, Phil, thank you so much for your for being here today. You guys are just terrific friends, but you've also given us a deep, deep level of insight into important development. Uh, what's the best way for people to keep up with all of you? 
Should we follow the CIC uh, account on Twitter or is it as we should do? Twitter, LinkedIn, and our website. Well, I, I asked the communication person, I got the best possible answer. That's right. Well, uh, once again, thank you all. Um, we look forward to following up uh, maybe next year because we'll see more and more of these kind of projects, we hope. Um, and in the meantime, thanks again. But don't go away, friends. Don't go away. We have uh, we have to mention what's happening over the next week. Uh, so next week, uh, which is December 17th, somehow, uh, we will have a return guest, uh, the very great Will Richardson, uh, who is someone who's done fantastic work in digital technology in K-12. through And he's going to be talking with us about the changing nature of stories about schools and schooling. Now, please join us. Now, if you'd like to look back at some of our previous forum sessions extending back three, almost four years, you can find our recordings on YouTube. Just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. If you'd like to keep having these conversations going, including talking to CIC, including wondering how best to take the humanities forward, please join our conversation on Facebook, on LinkedIn, take a look at our Slack channel, and of course, follow us on Twitter and uh, tweet at us at the hashtag FTTE. In the meantime, thank you all, friends, for great conversations on a splendid topic. It's been a real delight. I'll be here for another five minutes or so to chat if you'd like. Otherwise, we'll see you online next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>